Heartless, Forbidden, Book One, written by Susanna Thompson, narrated by Colina Schubert. Chapter 12. Mom and I went shopping for her wedding dress the next day. I talked to Robert, she told me during the drive to the store. He said that he didn't even know that you didn't have a ride to work. Cade must have taken it upon himself to pick you up, and he was being modest when he told you that his father sent him. He's such a sweet and thoughtful boy. I wanted to puke at her praise of him. He was the exact opposite of sweet and thoughtful, so I couldn't fathom why he had picked me up from work Friday night and last night if his dad hadn't made him do it. Now that I knew it wasn't a parental directive, I was going to put a stop to it. There was no way that I was going to let someone my own age boss me around. Mom actually decided on a wedding dress that very day. It was more plain and simple than what I would have picked out, but it looked good on her. The light sheath dress had a lace halter and looked like an elegant Hollywood gown. The veil was what made it obvious that Mom was a bride. She also chose a pink bridesmaid dress for me. I tried to argue, but she was enamored with it when I tried it on. You look so cute, she exclaimed. Oh, how precious. My dress was short and strapless, but it had a long, sheer overlay skirt that made it look like a whimsical fairy dress. I had to admit that it was cute, but I wanted something more understated like Mom's dress. The fanciful concoction would draw everyone's attention to me. I feel ridiculous, I lied. I look like a sugar plum fairy. The little girl in me who loved fairy tales and ballerinas responded to the sweet, airy appeal of the dress. Mom voiced the notion by gushing. My little girl, look at you, you're almost grown. Then she clinched it. If your father could see you now. Those words took all the argument out of me. He can see me, I said softly. It was what she had always told me before, but now she was making it sound like he was truly gone. I hadn't even been able to visit his grave since we moved here, and he felt further away from me than ever. We had left behind all our connections to him except for pictures, and I didn't have any of me and him together. The closest one I had was of him smiling with his arm around my mom with her little baby bump. She had only been five months pregnant when he was killed in a car crash. There was a bend in the road, and he'd run off it and hit a tree. The impact had killed him instantly, so he was already dead when the paramedics arrived. Mom and Grandma found out about it when the police came to the house in the middle of the night. They had been up waiting for him to return home from his friend's birthday party, and they had known that something was wrong when it got so late, and there was still no sign of him. They were both standing outside in the yard, arguing about which one of them would go to look for him when they saw the cop car pulling up to the curb. I had asked Mom once why she hadn't gone to the birthday party with him, and she told me that my grandma wouldn't let her. Due to my mom's delicate condition, my grandma had insisted that she should rest at home in the evenings. Since mom was living in her house, she acquiesced to grandma's wishes. I wanted to drive him to that party, she told me with a touch of bitterness. But your grandma thought that pregnant women shouldn't be driving. But you would have been in the accident too, I had said. You might have been killed too. She had glanced at me quickly and looked away. Maybe. I had been 13 when we'd had that conversation, and I was caught up in the tragic circumstances of their love story. As I contemplated it now, I realized that Mom thought she could have prevented the accident if she had been the one driving the car. Was Dad speeding? I asked as we walked out of the bridal shop. She responded with a quizzical look to my out-of-the-blue question. When he crashed, I clarified, is that why he ran off the road? Her expression gave me my answer along with her hesitation before speaking. The police thought so. For the first time ever, I felt some anger at my dad. So it was reckless driving. That's why he died? He was young, she replied in an attempt to excuse his actions. That's how young guys drive. It was such a disappointment to know that I had lost my dad because of his own stupid behavior. Cade doesn't, I snapped. He's a total asshole, but he's not a reckless driver. My dad was so wonderful, but he got killed because of doing one stupid thing. How is that fair? Mom was completely taken aback by my outburst. Why are you saying that about Cade? He's been nothing but nice to you. I snorted. Yup, I agreed sarcastically. Cade is such a nice guy. 
He isn't? she questioned. Oh, he is, I continued mockingly. He's so nice that he called you a gold digger and wanted you to sign a prenup because he thought you were just after his dad's money. Her expression was now filled with compassion and understanding. Oh, honey, you can't blame him for that. There are women who will go after a rich man for his money. I'm sure he's seen it before, so it's natural for him to mistrust my motives. It'll take some time for me to gain his trust. Good luck with that, I told her. I wouldn't even bother if I was you. You don't think I can win him over, she asked, although I could tell she thought I was being overdramatic about this. I don't think anyone can win him over, I said. He doesn't care about anyone, Mom. He's the most selfish person I've ever met. To my surprise, she smiled warmly at me. You're a wonderful daughter, Lexi. I understand you taking offense for what he said about me, but you're being too hard on him. He's just being a good son and looking out for his father. And he's already proven that he cares about you. Why else would he go through the trouble of picking you up from work? That was a good question, and it troubled me. Doing a good deed for someone didn't fit with Cade's selfishness. He didn't do things just to be nice. I decided that he must have some kind of ulterior motive. Whatever it was, he was in for a rude awakening. No matter how many unexpectedly nice things he did, I wasn't going to fall prey to his hidden agenda. I wasn't as heartless as he was, but I could harden my heart against him. When I showed up at the end of my shift that night, I coolly thanked him and didn't say anything else. Your mom lets you work this late on school nights? He questioned. His subtle criticism for her immediately raised my ire. Only on Sundays when I've had plenty of sleep and nobody asked you to come and get me. I know your dad didn't send you, so why are you here? I take care of what's mine, he said. My thoughts stuttered to a stop. What? You're part of my family now that dad is insisting on marrying your mom, he replied. By the way, Pink, I didn't figure you for a girly girl. I was completely lost now. Pink, I repeated. He pulled into the parking lot in front of my apartment building and glanced at me. Your bridesmaid dress. How do you know about that? I asked. Your mom told my dad so that I'd know what color I'd need to match, he answered as he parked the car in front of my building. I had a sinking feeling. Your, your partner, he finished for me. I'm walking you down the aisle at the wedding. Just shoot me now, I exclaimed. He grinned at my response. I knew you'd be thrilled about it. I couldn't react because that open, spontaneous smile had blindsided me. I had never seen a real smile on his face before, and it outdid all his smirks and false friendliness. It was the kind of smile I wanted to see all the time, and I gazed at him as it slowly faded. He leaned in, and I had time to anticipate his kiss. It started as soft and slow, as our other one began fast and rough, but it ended up as deep and sensual as the first one. Being in separate seats in the front of his car prevented me from ending up in the same position as last time. Come home with me, Kate urged seductively as he pulled back only millimeters from my lips and then kissed me again. That brief kiss left me wanting more as he pulled completely away from me and restarted the car. He was driving toward the exit of the parking lot when I realized that he had taken my silence as a scent. I can't, I told him breathlessly. My mom won't know where I am. He exhaled in frustration. You're right. You can't tell her you're spending the night with me. He bypassed the exit and circled back around to my building. We'll have to wait till you move in. I was coming out of my haze of lust, and clarity was an unwelcome reality check. My soon-to-be stepbrother was making plans to have sex with me. The reason for him giving me these rides home from work was now obvious, and I had allowed it to happen when I had known that I should be wary of him. We'll wait. I assured him. You'll be waiting until hell freezes over, I added silently as my resolve and common sense belatedly returned. I knew now that it wouldn't be so easy for me to ignore my attraction to him, and it would be even more difficult once I was living with him. It would be a challenge, but it wasn't impossible to resist him. I would just have to be on my guard all the time, and it would be worth it to see him realize that he couldn't have everything he wanted.' 